like to start today um, with a few words about perhaps the background of the Salon series generally, because I've been asked uh, quite a few times now why we're doing this, um, the topic of strengthening civilization. So the Salon series really is on the topic of strengthening civilization, um, and that really is a pretty big goal. And the purpose of strengthening civilization, of course, is to secure a positive future, which is an even bigger goal. And a friend recently asked me, well, do you think you can save the future? And I actually think that's an important question to ask, because here's the situation. If you think you can, you'll likely spend your whole life trying, and you won't rest. Um, that's a pre pretty big decision, so I think it's good to consider the alternative. If you don't think you can, you may be able to enjoy the limited time you have, rather than spend it on trying to save the future. And I think sometimes I wish I, we knew that there really was one extinction scenario that would inevitably evade us in 100 years. Because if that was the case, we could really focus our lives on just enjoying every single blissful moment right now. But we don't know that fact, right? We don't know that we have to go extinct. And granted, it doesn't really look rosy right now, um, with accelerating technological capability going hand in hand with an ever more complicated civilization. But it's really not impossible that we'll make it through. So I think we have to try. And I think there's multiple reasons for trying. One of them is practical. Um, could you actually enjoy every blissful moment right now? If you knew there was just a tiny chance you could make a difference, could you like actually enjoy it? I don't think so. Perhaps the quest fails and we do our best, but at the final moment something else comes along last minute and makes us go extinct anyways. But imagine the opposite scenario, right? Imagine you have not tried, and it turns out you could have done something. An idea that you might have had, or a skill that you could have given, was missing, and now it's too late. So let's choose to make a difference, knowing the opportunity cost of leading a good life, and because we simply couldn't do it any other way. Because not trying is not an option. If you're absolutely sure that we're doomed, that's OK. In that case, uh, opt out of the quest and enjoy your life. But you might think that there is a chance that we can make it through, create a great future, and that it's worth trying. And if you opt in, then I think there's really no space anymore to focus on how terrible everything is, right? Because we've just confessed to how terrible everything is, and we've decided that despite of that, we're still going to try, even though the chances are small. We've chosen to still try, instead of enjoying our life in the here and now. So do you opt in or out? I think if you're down for the challenge, let's take that bundle of existential angst and worries and put it to the side, just for a moment. We've dealt with them, and we've decided that we're still going to do it. And this doesn't mean ignoring the risks, but it means not getting upset at them anymore. It means seeing them now as your personal challenge. It means looking at them in a more constructive way. And to see clearly and get an understanding of what our options are as a species, I created existentialhope.com, which was up here a second ago. Um, and the pro project really is a global progress tracker of the different fields that we need to solve to secure a positive future. And the website is divided into three sections. Um, one are the reasons of why we should really care about a positive long-term future and where we could be if we overcome the risks that we're also worried about. And that section really focuses on the positive futures rather than on the risks. It reminds of why we absolutely have to get there. If there's only one section you read, then read the one on existential um, angst and existential hope. The second section is a knowledge graph of the focus areas that we need to work on to make progress towards those futures. And the third one is focus on making a toolkit that is universally useful regardless of which area you want to make progress on. And the purpose, really, of this website is to lock in and share progress that we make on a macro level as civilization to help orient those who'd like to help make progress um, to get an overview of the areas that they can work on and self-select to the ones that they have a comparative advantage in solving. But it's really in its infancy and it's collaborative, um, so please go on the website and add any expertise that you have in focus areas, any tools for world improvement that you know of, um, any organizations you remember on, on neglected action items. Let's index our knowledge, act on it. And I think the fact that we can act on it really means that we must. I think our cosmic endowment really comes with great responsibility. Uh, in a recent paper by Drexler and Sandberg, 
uh, it dissolved the Fermi paradox with the result that it's actually really not unlikely that the great filter is behind us, that life in the form we know it is rare. This doesn't mean that there isn't another filter ahead of us, right? But it does mean that we might have more responsibility than we thought of. Because if life is really so rare, it's really on us to get it right. For the first time really in the history of life, one species has the ability to extinct all others. And that's a pretty unique situation. I think we really are at this unique cosmic bottleneck where we, we can either be the great force linking to this future or we could become the cosmic cool suck. And if life had stopped at the level of bacteria three billion years ago, it would have been a pity but kind of unavoidable. But if it stops now, it's not only a pity but we're guilty. Because different to bacteria, we have brains. And we can make choices. And that means we have to justify the choices that we make. And I think there's something interesting about it. I think as soon as we realize this is a choice, this can't be forgotten. Many people are not aware that there is a choice, but everyone in this room knows, right? And I think this knowledge really gives rise to an imperative to action, a normative cosmic imperative to bring about the better of those possible futures and avoid the worst ones. And I think here's the best part. Even if we fail, we might have won. Because I wasn't quite truthful at the beginning. We don't have to choose between saving the future and having a life that's intrinsically meaningful. This is because working toward a positive future is work that is intrinsically rewarding. I'm often really in a state of disbelief because of the incredible friends, all of you, that I make doing it and the tight appreciation for the interactions I have with the community and the compassion and the curiosity at everything in life. So it's really not a choice between happiness now and securing a positive future. We can really have it both ways. I think we all know the myth of Sisyphus and the absurd scenario of Sisyphus carrying the stone up the mountain, knowing it will roll down again. Albert Camus took this as an analogy of his struggle for meaning in a finite life and said we must still imagine Sisyphus to be a happy person because of even an absurd struggle for meaning in a finite life gives meaning to life. But I think our life really doesn't have to be absurd because we know that if we carry enough of our stones upwards, even if many of them roll down, eventually there's a small chance that we can create a structure on top of this mountain that allows the stones to stay up there and to, allows us to create a foundation to build humanity's next step on it. And I think this really makes all the difference. We're struggling, but for a cause. And that has at least a small percentage chance in, in succeeding. And isn't that really all we could ever ask for? and so much more than past strugglers had. They were sure the stones would roll down the mountain, that they were going to die, that life on Earth must end. Nietzsche said, in some remote corner of the universe, poured out and glittering in innumerable solar systems, there once was a star on which clever animals invented knowledge. That was the highest and most mendacious minute of world history. Yet only a minute. After nature had drawn a few breaths, the star grew old, and the clever animals had to die. There have been eternities when it did not exist, and when it's done for again, nothing will have happened. I think Camus, like Nietzsche, couldn't really see the technological advances that might allow us to live indefinitely. They couldn't see the advances that might allow us to, to create the insane futures that we can envision. But they still advocated trying, even in the face of meaninglessness. So we really have no excuse not to try, because we have a chance. I think it's really the first time in history that we've created the technologies for our destruction and our ascent. They're both in our hands and we have to decide how to use them. I think nihilism is lack of opportunity. It's solving the wrong problems. Both Camus and Nietzsche couldn't see past extinction, but we can, or at least a little bit. In a letter from Utopia, Bostrom is envisioning a being from the future, writing back to us to convince us to bring this future into existence. And he writes, we love life here every instant. Every second is so good that it would blow your minds had its amperage not been previously increased. My contemporaries and I bear witness, and we're requesting your aid. Please join us. Please help us come into existence. Whether this tremendous possibility becomes a reality depends on your actions. If your empathy can perceive at least the um, outlines of the visions I'm describing, then your ingenuity will find a way to make it real. Human life at its best is fantastic. I'm asking you to create something even greater, life that is truly humane. I think futures like those seem unimaginable right now, but they really are within our reach. 
and now is the time. When I found this community first, I kind of ran, ran around from one person to the other, flabbergasted, thinking, hey, you care, and you also care, and you also care. What a privilege really it is, it is for us to have found each other and to be able to have the chance to do this meaningful work together. We really are in this extreme fortune of being surrounded by people who care, who have competence and who commit. It's really quite marvelous. And the second thought I had when running around and to all of you was, just after how lucky that I found you, was why so late? We should be grateful and happy at the chance of making a difference. But we should also know that our time window is shortening and that the stakes are high. As Yukowski said, let's go forth and do the impossible. Today's salon is attempting the impossible by zooming outwards to look at civilization as a whole, its trajectory on the long run, and by zooming in on the role that institutions play, particularly in the creation and in the use of knowledge. And I'm so glad to have Samo here today to do this. Ever since his talk on this topic at EAG, it is ruminating on my mind. For the better, as it turns out, uh, since this topic is today more prevalent uh, than ever. So thank you so much for joining us today, and thank you so much, Salma, for joining us today. Thanks.